Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, friends. <clears throat> you know, it sort of feels quite odd. As you are aware, Uday has done the opening remarks for the bank religiously for the past umpteen years. And here I am, a night watchman being the opening batsman for a change. <clears throat> I'm sure there are quite a few such parallels in cricket. Hopefully, several of them would have lived up to their expectations. <clears throat> the Night Watchman piece also reminds me, you would have seen our announcement earlier in the day regarding receipt of the RBI approval for our recommendation of Ashok Vaswani as the next MD and CEO of the bank. Just to give you a quick background, Ashok, is a veteran banker with a proven track record, initially at Citigroup and then more recently at Barclays. He brings with him significant experience in building consumer and corporate businesses across various geographies, leveraging forward-leaning technologies. His recent stints have been as CEO of Barclays UK and as the global consumer and digital head of Barclays PLC. We expect Ashok to accelerate the pace of digital and technology at Kotak, focusing on delivering enhanced customer value. Friends, on the macro side, the India story continues to be exciting across most parameters. However, the emerging global geopolitical trend warrants increasing caution. Increasing oil prices are what we have to monitor closely. Its additive impact on domestic inflation trends need to be watched out for. Liquidity, again, is likely to continue being tight, whether driven by policy or by market pressures. And hence, as indicated by, uh, by our governor recently, this will keep pressure on interest rates. Fortunately, the credit cycle still looks acceptable. However, continuing inflation and elevated interest rates will ultimately create uncomfortable outcomes. Net-net, for some time into the near future, I expect the growth to NIM trade-off to be better bet as compared to the growth to credit trade-off, and probably that's what we will be following. Coming specifically to Kotak, Jamin will take you through the numbers and by other colleagues. You will note that the financials look very balanced and comfortable across all parameters. Growth is well-rounded. You will, however, see a more than expected drop in NIMS this time, but as Jamin will explain, about 15, 16 odd basis points of it is unlikely to be repeated. SA continues to be a challenge, especially the higher ticket size ones. And if you exclude the government business related SA, I suspect this is going to be an industry wide problem. That's from all from my side. Jamin, over to you. Uh, thank you, Deepak. So let me take the commentary on the on the quarter. Uh, let me take the consolidated numbers first. So if we look at the current quarter, we ended the quarter with a post-tax profit of 4461 crores, which is roughly about 24% uh, higher than what we did in the same quarter last year, and about 7% higher than what we did in quarter one this year. The bank contributed about 72% of the overall profits with 3191 crores. Uh, Kotak Securities being the other major contributor with 324 crores of post-tax profit, which was a growth of 45% over what they recorded a year ago. Kotak Securities market share again continuing to grow from what was 5% in quarter two last year to 8.8% this period. Quoted Prime brought in 208 crores this year, which is a tad lower than what they did last year, which is mainly due to a uh, reduction of some profits on account of a rundown of a bought-out portfolio, which we had done a year ago. 
Uh, the vehicle finance business in Kota Prime continued to grow, which was about 31% growth on a YOY basis and about 9% on a QOQ basis. The other NBFC, which is Kotak Investments, had a post-tax profit of 126 crores, which is significantly higher than 78%, 78 crores, which was a year ago. This is on the back of a close to 50% growth in its advances book, YOY. Uh, the business correspondent entity, BSS, which is largely microfinance, crossed a 100 crore per quarter mark for the first time, the post-tax profit being 108 crores this quarter. And as we had announced earlier this week, the RBI had also, has also approved our acquisition of another microfinance company, which is Sonata, based headquartered in the Uttar Pradesh. The life insurance entity brought in a post-tax profit of 247 crores, which is against 270 they did in quarter two last year and 193 crores in the sequentially preceding quarter. The domestic mutual fund business brought in 124 crores with the Overall assets under management at the group level increasing by about 28% YOY coming to close to 5 lakh crores at the group level. Uh, at quarter one, we had uh, uh, a consolidated adjustment of about 375 crores, which was largely on account of dividends which, which was collected from the subsidiaries. Our customer asset at the consolidated level at about 4,28,000 crores, about 19% higher than what we did a year ago. Continuing to have healthy capital ratios, uh, the overall net worth at the group level at about 1,20,000 crores, the bank contributing close to 75% of it. Both the NBFC's prime and investments having capital ratios of 27 and 28% respectively. Uh, life again having a solvency ratio reasonably higher at 2.7%. It gets us to an ROA at the group level of 2.68 and book value including the profits for this quarter at 605 rupees per share. Uh, coming to the bank standalone, the bank too con uh, clocked a 24% YOY growth in post-tax profit with bringing in 3191 crores of profits this quarter. The net interest income for this period grew 23% YOY to 6297 crores. We also saw growth of fees and services to 2,226 crores this quarter. The other income, which is non-fees and services part, had a drop Q1 to Q2, one of that being the reason being the dividend which came from the subsidiaries brought roughly about 300 crores in quarter one, which was not there in quarter two. Similarly, there was a Treasury profit in Q1, which also included what we gained on some security receipts, which is absent in Q2. Uh, this resulted in an overall profit for Q2 being lower than Q1. We continue to have a pretty large part of our book in AFS and HFT. At September, 20, September 30, 75% of our book was in AFS and HFT, with the modified duration being net of OIS being 1.2 years. Our overall cost for this quarter, 4,000 crores, which is about 19% higher than what it was a year ago, but just a tad up from what it was uh, in the previous quarter. Uh, other operating expenses this quarter includes certain amount which we spent on promotion and marketing. Our pre-provisioning profits giving us a 29% YOI growth at 4,610 crores. Provisioning of 367 crores coming to a post-provisioning of 4244 crores. Our advances, which includes uh, before the IBPS or BRDS, we brought in a 25% growth on a YOY basis, and this quarter itself saw a growth of 6%, which is not annualized. On a YOY basis, we've seen growth across categories, credit cards, unsecured personal loans, home loans, lab, factors, CVCs, microfinance, this quarter, of course, saw a growth in the corporate loan book also. Our unsecured retail book, including the microfinance activity, stands at 11% of our advances. NIM at 5.22 this quarter against 5.15 a year ago, though lower than what we saw in the uh, previous quarter. Mind you, NIM is a calculation of balances on a daily average basis, 
and not necessarily the end of period. So during this period, we did have our active money growth coming in at 28% on the quarter. Some of it also came in from movement from our lower cost deposit accounts into active money. This quarter also saw the bank going in for some higher liquidity buffers, which resulted also in the LCR taking up on a quarter-on-quarter basis. We also had some short-term funds, including a spate of IPOs which happened, which got invested into liquid investments at marginal gains on, on that transaction, but thus pulled down the overall yields and thereby the overall NIMS. Sequentially, as Deepak mentioned, we do, do have some one-offs this period, roughly about 14, 15 bits. As of June 30, the bank had 45.8 million customers, which is about 9.2 million higher than what it was a year ago. Asset quality at the bank, GNPA down from 2.08 a year ago to 1.78, even in absolute terms down from 6,200 crores to 6,087. And with a PCR of 79%, our net NPA now at 0.37 versus what it was 0.55 a year ago. Strip edges this quarter saw 1314 crores, which did include things which went back into the normal category, about 300 crores, what upgraded during the quarter. Therefore, net strip edges coming at just over 1,000 crores. Our fund base restructured standard under COVID and MSME at about 0.15% of our overall advances. SMA2 continuing to be low, which is for borrowers over 5 crores at 155 crores. CASA at 48.3% as of 30th September, and capital adequacy, including this quarter's profits at the bank, again healthy at 21.7, with most of it being CET1, which is 20.6. And therefore, this quarter, we'd have an annualized ROA at the bank level of 2.45. I'd pass it on to Banyan to uh, take up the uh, overall details. Hi, thank you, Jamie. Uh, I'll make a short commentary on the wholesale business. Uh, during the quarter, we saw some reasonable demand for credit offtake from both larger corporates and SMEs. This quarter, our advances grew at a rate of about 17% YOY and 5% QOQ, but that is not the full story, as you know. We uh, need to look at the credit substitute book as well. Our credit substitute book witnessed some reduction as we focus more on loans with better spread than the low-yielding bonds. Given the current interest rate scenario, our focus on credit substitutes will remain relatively subdued. Overall, our funded asset book, including credit substitutes, grew at about 10% YOI and 3% QOQ. Non-SME corporate would have grown just at about reaching double digits. Uh, on the conglomerate side, we saw a shift of our book from uh, bonds into uh, advances. Um, so uh, it, it did show a healthy growth in advances. NBFC uh, segment remains uh, fairly robust. On the large corporate and mid-corporate space, if you recall, last time I had apprised you of the fact that we have set up a separate vertical for mid-corporate. Both these segments are growing at a healthy pace, and in fact, uh, mid-corporate is growing at close to 8 to 10% QOQ. On SME, uh, while it remains our focus area, we are seeing some irrational competitive pressures in this segment, and this is putting pressure on risk-reward metrics of this business, leading to some moderation in the growth to protect the profitability and ROE of uh, this segment. We continue to scale up manpower and expand geographical footprint. Um, the SME book grew at about 16% YOY and 5% QOQ. The quality of the portfolio continues to be healthy. We continue to be focusing on identifying opportunities to leverage our structuring and advisory capabilities to identify better yielding assets without commensurate increase in the risk. Uh, the book continues to overall, the corporate book continues to be healthy and with very negligible credit costs. On the liability side, balances have been bolstered strongly by the custody flows in the uh, offshore space. Uh, on the non-custody front, we are seeing lower growth rates than we have seen in the past. We continue to focus on transaction banking business, garnering higher work wallet shares in collections and payment. Tax payment flows grew uh, robustly this quarter at about 12% QOQ. 
while DCM had a subdued quarter due to slippages in some large deal revenue, growth of our other fee income remained robust. Uh, technology remains a key focus area, and our investment in this space have ensured significant improvement in stability of our systems through this quarter. And with minimal downtime, FIN has uh, our integrated uh, corporate portal for trade, CMS, and account services is ramping up quite well. And we have now gone live also with electronic bank guarantee uh, solutions. Uh, we also went live with a 365-day CMS solution during this quarter. Overall, the business remains in good health with healthy ROIs and robust, robust uh, profit growth. Now, I'll hand it over to Shanti to take you through the commercial banks. Thank you, Manian. I'll talk about the commercial banking business. The commercial vehicle industry saw a marginal uptick in volumes in Q2, 7% variable for the quarter, though H1 was muted at 2% overall. This is on the volume. Some of this growth in Q2 is also due to larger wholesale dispatches in preparation for the expected festival demand period. At an industry level, the freight demand, viability, and availability of return load continues to be stable with uh, the usual uh, monsoon sporadic disruptions. We expect this to get better as we get into the festival season. Within CV, in line with the trend in Q1, demand for passenger bus segment continues to witness significant growth at 33% YOY, whereas a good segment, MSCV witnessed some demand while SCV continues to show a flattish trend. Our disbursement volumes grew 30% YOY, and it continued to outpace the growth in the industry, and we were able to improve some market share. Collection efficiency continues to be stable, and we will build our books and market share in the sector with a focus on risk-adjusted returns and more geographic distribution equipment. Coming to the construction equipment, the industry has seen a strong YOI growth of 23% in value terms, aided by a pickup in execution of infrastructure projects, earth-moving equipment, road handling, material handling equipment. All of it saw a growth. Uh, we could see healthy growth in roads, semi-urban housing, airports, sports, also pick up due to the projects. I think the overall macroeconomic environment in, in, and trust in infra has really helped improve the demand for the construction equipment. Our disbursement in value terms to 39% YOI in a quarter two and health has gained market share. Collections are stable too. And we expect to maintain our growth momentum in this segment in the second half of the year. Tractor. The wholesale tractor industry was down by 6.6 YOY on a Q2 and in H1 YOY, primarily on account of the delayed and uneven rainfall in a few states. Uh, compared to last year, there was a drop in September because the Navaratras were in October this year as compared to September. Our tractor disbursements in volume terms were up 9% for the second quarter. We continue to marginally increase our market share. We continue to remain the market leader in this space. Gross NPA is maintained at last year's level. Collection efficiencies have remained stable. But we are seeing a few states where collections are beginning to see marginal stress because of efficient rainfall. We expect this to get better as we get into the second half of the year. Microfinance, our microcredit business continued its momentum growth and a healthy growth in disbursement of 65% via one. We have presence currently in 12 states through a network of 800 plus BC branches and have a customer base close to 17 lakh women borrowers. Asset quality continues to be strong. Our microcredit business was able to ensure delivery of credit to low income households in agri allied and micro-enterprises. We foresee healthy credit demands in the rural economy uh, in this business. Uh, as Deepak had mentioned, or uh, Jeremy, the bank has received the approval from RBI for acquisition of Sonata Finance, a Lucknow-based NBFC MSI. Sonata has operations in 10 states with a network of 540 branches and close to 1 million customers as of 30th September. We will work towards consummation of this uh, by uh, the fourth quarter of this year. On the agricultural SME side, it, the growth was more muted uh, because of lower utilization due to commodity prices as well as some amount of demand. The collection continues to remain strong in terms of the credit quality, and we expect credit growth 
to pick up in the second half as we get into the um, business, better business cycle and busy period will continue to be an area of focus for us. I will now request Vira to take us through the consumer bank highlights. Vira? Thanks, Shanti. Uh, I'll start with consumer assets. Our unsecured product in consumer bank continues to show positive traction with a growth of 44% YOY and approximately 9% on quarter-on-quarter basis. From a risk perspective, our unsecured loans portfolio continues to hold and is adequately priced for the risk. Our mortgage lending business continues to grow well at 15% on a YOY basis. We see strong traction in the loan against property segment, which has been a traditional area of strength for us. This book continues to hold well on all parameters of collections. We continue to invest in our card franchise with overall credit card advances growing by 59% on buy buy basis. Our market shares have been steadily growing both on spend and card enforce. To deliver value to our card customer, we have been working on getting unique offers for them. I am sure most of you would have noticed our sponsorship to Trevor Nova events recently. We also participated in the big billion days by Flipkart, Mentra and Cleartrust. Overall, our investment in technology has helped us to improve productivity. Happy to share that this quarter, we have launched our revamped loan origination system built on Salesforce platform for our lab business. We also went live with our new digital collection platform last quarter. Our story on digital acquisition continues and significant proportion of personal loans and credit cards continue to be sourced end-to-end -end digitally. I'll now move on to the business banking Consumer bank secured working capital growth has been strong with a growth of 21% on YOY basis. While the demand for new working capital secured loans has been strong, however, improvement in the limit utilization is relatively slow. We witnessed formalization gathering pace in this segment, and as a result, our share on the lending to microenterprise is growing. Fueled by market demand and par uh, partnerships, the unsecured business loan segment witnessed a volume growth. Our delinquencies on both the secured and unsecured books remain stable in this business banking sector. Now I move to liabilities. The total deposits have grown 23% on YOY basis with major contribution coming from term deposits. With an objective of growing retail and granular SAR deposits, we have taken a couple of initiatives over the last two quarters, and we hope that this would give us some better results going forward. As you know, bank had launched active money proposition in May 23 that allowed savers to earn higher interest on the deposits. In this quarter, bank focused on scaling up the active money proposition by leveraging technology and analytical capabilities. Bank deployed intuitive engagement campaigns to multiple touch points, which helped customers to understand and subscribe for offering which resulted in substantial jump in mobilization of incremental deposits. However, this did have an impact on our retail SAR, where some of the balances moved from SAR to active money. Continuing its thrust on customer centricity, the bank has kept focus on identifying customer insights via research and surveys to sharpen the customer value proposition specific to micro segments. Steps taken during the period have not only aided in acquisition of customers, but have also resulted in better customer onboarding experience reflected in higher NPS scores. Bank had recently launched a straight-through digital onboarding journeys for saving the corporate salary account opening. In second quarter, bank has invested in initi initiatives like search engine optimization and focused performance marketing, which has resulted in very good growth in acquisition through this new channel of acquisition. We have, done, we have gone live with do-it-yourself journey for individual and sole proprietary customers to open their current account using video KYC and are seeing early signs of demand for digital fulfillment in the market. With this, I'll pass on to Milan to give an update on digital. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Virat. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Milan Nagman, Chief Technology Officer, and I'll uh, an update on our digital and technology portfolio. We regularly share updates on the new digital journey that went live, uh, as Virat also alluded uh, in his narrative. These are digital journeys for self-service, opening up current accounts, savings accounts, personal loan accounts, and so on. 
These journeys are important contributors to business growth, customer acquisition, and digitization. Equally important, however, are the invisible parts of the technology transformation which require their own deep set of technical skills. At Kotak, we have a silent but massive transformation underway on modernizing the backends. These are technology changes that are required to transform and upgrade the backends, which include networking, data centers, core product processors, such as core banking platforms, loan processing platforms, general ledgers, operational systems, treasury platforms, and also setting up of DevOps pipelines, builder tools, and a culture of core engineers to build important pieces of core backend platforms. Top performing engineers will not just be able to join a bank and start building platforms that mimic consumer tech apps. And for that, a massive enabling ecosystem is required to facilitate engineering skills to produce the outcomes. There is, of course, an easy path of just outsourcing these platforms, but we are not doing that. We are making investments in people, processes, and enabling technologies to fortify our backends, and these will be important drivers to ensure stability, scalability, resiliency of our platforms, and get more control on the technologies uh, behind the systems we use. I call these invisible changes because if a firm is focused only on the visible front ends and journeys, they can easily lose track of the mega upgrades in talent processes and backend technologies that are required to fortify their own cores. And this invisible backend transformation requires leadership that is technically savvy, that is hands-on, and we have made a huge headway in getting that leadership in place. We have made a great start to get this journey going. We have lots of work ahead of us to fortify the core, to match the speed and agility of front-end journeys that our customers expect from us. The fruits of these backend efforts, the fruits of these backend efforts will be durable and will positively impact many future quarters to come in a silent way. I hope that context was useful. And with that, I will turn it over to Jedi. Thank you, Milan. Uh, I'll talk of uh, the numbers for quota securities before uh, some of the other uh, highlights uh, of the quarter. Uh, total income uh, increased to 962 crores in this quarter versus 776 crores in the corresponding quarter last year and 805 crores in the previous quarter. Uh, the profit before tax for Q2 of uh, this financial year is 432 crores against 298 crores in Q2 of FI23 and 292 crores in the last quarter. Uh, the corresponding PAT uh, for this quarter is 324 crores against 224 crores in uh, the same period last year and 219 crores in uh, the last year. Uh, our cash market share uh, showed some decline and is at 10% for Q2 of SI24. And the combined market share uh, showed a jump of close to 90% uh, year on year from 5% to 8.8%. Uh, for Quotex Securities, uh, uh, NEO is the new age trading platform and is a complete ecosystem of mobile, web, API, and trading terminals. Currently, 80% uh, of the futures and options volume, and 70% of traded orders are through NEO. Total orders on NEO have grown 608% YOY and 100% Q&Q. Uh, Code of Securities was one of the first few brokers to have launched the BSE FNO through NEO and has already taken a reasonably decent market share uh, in the last two and a half months which it launched the BSE FNO. All new digital accounts which are opened in the last quarter or so is via NEO, and hopefully by the end of Q4, all dealer based businesses will also move to NEO. There are quite a few new age features which, are, which we are planning to launch on NEO in the next quarter or so, which will get unfolded as we talk now. 
there is a significant investment which is being made in revamping our back office operations and the CRM for a far better customer experience. With this, I hand over to Nilesh to take us through the mutual fund uh, business. Thank you. Thanks, Jaydeep. Let me talk about our asset management business. In second quarter, FY24, our total average assets under management grew 18% year on year to reach rupees 3.36 trillion. Our equity average AUM grew 24% year on year to reach rupees 1.88 trillion. Our active equity AUM market share grew to 6.47 in second quarter at 523. Our SIP inflows for September 23 grew 22% by OY to rupees 10.2 billion. Our retail AUM stands at 57% of total AUM. Our profit after tax grew 17% to rupees 124 crore in second quarter at 524 on back of AUM growth. During the quarter, Kotak multi asset allocation NFO collected over rupees 3,650 crore. Our total AUM across mutual fund, EMS, offshore, insurance, and alternate assets grew 28% YOY to rupees 4.98 trillion, led by offshore funds and alternate assets. We continue to manage the largest India dedicated offshore fund. Wise Kotak Funds India mid cap fund with AUM in excess of three and a half billion. I'll hand it over to my colleague Shreem Srinivasan. Hi, uh, we are building a comprehensive platform of alternative assets which comprises uh, six different asset classes by raising capital from global institutional investors as well as domestic institutional and uh, private client investors. In the previous quarter, our data center fund with, uh, with commitments of $590 million had made an investment of $72 million in CIFI in finite spaces, which is the data center arm of CIFI. Uh, discretionary portfolio solutions under the brands of Optimus and Iconic presently manage $424 million, effective 30th September 2023. Uh, we've also raised a private credit fund to, uh, to provide capital to mid-market companies. Uh, as of 30th September, we have raised $109 million from uh, domestic, institution, domestic investors in this particular fund. I now hand over to Deepak Gupta. Hi. I'm back with uh, Kotak Prime. Kotak Prime uh, had a quarterly profit after tax of 208 crores. That's roughly about the same level as what we had in Q1 and actually lower than what we had in Q2 of last year. Remember last year we had acquired uh, uh, portfolios of Volkswagen uh, and subsequently Ford, so these have been running off and hence you see the decline in uh, profitability. But otherwise, the base car finance uh, business per se, including the dealer finance piece, is extremely robust. Uh, we're seeing demand being slow at the lower end of the car business. However, SUVs and top-end premium segments continue to be growing very well. There is a buildup of uh, dealer inventory, uh, because some of the past festivals have not necessarily gone down well. <clears throat> Fingers are crossed for how the Sera and Diwali will be. On, 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 on to Kodak Life Insurance. Kodak Life Insurance had a muted uh, quarter. The profit of tax for the quarter was 247 crores. If you see uh, the, the individual regular premium business, that has been slow in terms of Growth, we were probably caught on the wrong foot uh, by in, in, in our aggression on the non-par side. Uh, traditionally, we've been uh, pretty aggressive on the non-par side of the marketplace, but this time we were not sure about the direction in which interest rates were moving, and hence we were cautious, and that probably impacted some of the individual uh, regular premiums. Otherwise, as we build up Q3 and Q4, the growth momentum should continue. With that, friends, I uh, will hand it uh, over uh, back to the operator for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star N1 <coughs> on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star N2. 
participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is able to address questions from all participants in the conference, please limit your questions to one or two per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, we would request you to rejoin the queue. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Kunal Shah from City Group. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi. So, uh, firstly, with respect to this 14, 15 bits of uh, margin one-off, which will not be uh, repeated. I'm not sure if you uh, highlighted the reason for that and uh, uh, maybe where we are seeing it. Or is it more to do with the uh, TD sweep uh, and that's the reason you are confident that it will not come through. Maybe that uh, will stabilize now. So, uh, Kunal, let me just take that. Uh, if you take the obvious ones, it is like, you know, you had the CRR impact this quarter, which will not, not expect it as gone. The liquidity buffers, which I talked about earlier, which we, we may continue to have that, but may not be as much as what we had in this quarter. So it's not that it is completely tapered off, but that's not likely to be at those, those kind of levels. I also talked earlier about the fact that, you know, we had some short term inflows which had to be kind of invested into short-term yeah. investments. Now, on a marginal basis, this gives you positive returns. But if you look at the calculation of the NIMS, they kind of depress the yields overall because the denominator just floats. To that extent, the extent of those kind of uh, marginal uh, or short-term money which comes in could be different. So if I look at my average earning assets, because that's what goes into the denominator for calculating your uh, net interest margins. The best is if you can have as high the number as advances, because that brings you much better yields. This quarter, if I look at sequentially, the segment or the share of advances actually has dropped from what it was a quarter ago. So maybe we do expect that this get to getting back to the normal levels as we go forward. So that's broadly what we said is some of this may not be of, of these kind of levels as we go forward. Okay, so assuming that if you purely look at spreads in terms of uh, uh, yields and cost of deposit, then uh, that should have been uh, 16, 17 odd basis points kind of an impact. Uh, if I look at yields on advances, they have more or less held up. <coughs> so yields on advances overall has not changed. <coughs> so yes, the cost of funds would have gone up to that extent that would impact the spreads, but yields on advances have held up. The rest of the commentary is on account of the other things like you know, the mix of change, the change in the mix of funding, uh, the cost of PD is going up and the rest. But effectively, overall, advances yields have been holding up. Yes, overall cost of funds have gone up for two reasons, as I think one of you mentioned about the cost of deposits itself going up and the mix, which is the low cost deposits share going down. Okay. Uh, let me let me explain, Kunal. Kunal, let, let me explain. Yeah, if you look at just yield on advances, it's about the same level. If you look yeah. at cost of deposits, it's up by about 20. Yeah, so roughly that's the NIM drop. The delta 15 is arising out of all the other aspects which uh, Jamin mentioned. Most of it is unlikely to repeat next quarter. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, that answers the question. And second one, now that the event is over with respect. CEO uh, appointment, if you can highlight in terms of uh, maybe how many means were shared with uh, RBI and, and in terms of the order in which it would have been shared and finally we saw like Mr. Narvaswani getting appointed as a MD. And, uh, yeah. I don't get a question, but that's not relevant. I think uh, 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 the RBI has given its approval to our recommendation. I guess that's uh, good enough. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Rahul from GS. Please go ahead. I think let's move ahead. The line for Mr. Rahul has dropped. Uh, may we move to the next question, please? 
Yes. Thank you, sir. Our next question is from the line of Abhishek M. from HSBC. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening. Um, so my question is on cost of funds or cost of deposits. Uh, how far along are we in the repricing and uh, how much more to go from here? If you can give a sense of that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, if you look at the average tenor of our liabilities that we've been talking about, it's roughly about, you know, uh, uh, 10 months to 11 months. And if you look at the interest rate cycle, we, you know, more or less, or close to, you know, closing the 10 to 11 months. So in my sense, um, you know, except for global factors, tight liquidity, increase in rates otherwise, we're more or less there on the re uh, repricing, maybe a quarter or so. I think the cycle of repricing has, um, uh, you know, been, has, has, has come its distance. That's the way I put it. Okay, and given that you're card rates are mostly, you know, roughly around 7-ish, uh, at least in the one to three-year bucket where you're getting most of the deposits, uh, that would leave about 50-odd uh, bips on the TD side, 50, 60 bips on the TD side for repricing, right? So that catch-up could happen in a quarter, given the short tenor of liability. Is that the right I think a lot has happened. That's not correct, yeah. Okay. No, no, that's not the catch-up, and that's yes. not the loan. Yes, it's not yes. the average TD. cost of TD is not the TD. That's right. See, you have to, you're assuming that everything is coming in the one year end, right? You have sweep at 180 days. And if you see this quarter, we've had very strong sweep close. You have TD at one year. You have TDs at 270 days. So I'm saying your average cost of TD is not in the 7% uh, because of the range of tenors that it comes to. That's why your average liability uh, uh, cycle is around uh, 10, 11 years. Right, got that. And just. Secondly, uh, Deepak, your uh, you know opening comment on you know growth to NIM trade off will be better than the growth to credit trade off. Uh, does that mean incrementally you'd be looking to do more of you know higher quality, let's say home loan, corporate loans, and uh, something of that sort? Just wanted to get a sense of you know what you meant. No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that uh, the credit cycle is still playing off, and you are still pretty well off continuing the product mix which is outlined, yeah. It, it's still is safe to play the growth path assuming the mix of credit which we really have, yeah, rather than start being cautious on credit at this point of view. That's what I really mean. Cool. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks for those. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Jay Mundra from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening, sir. Uh, <clears throat> sir, in your opening remarks, again, uh, more or less the same question. Uh, you had mentioned that, you know, the growth versus name and growth versus credit cost. Uh, credit cost. Uh, at the same time, uh, two quarters back, uh, you know, the bank had a, a view that, uh, you know, corporate growth um, was uh, the risk reward apart from credit cost also, but in terms of tenor and in terms of pricing uh, was also not that favorable. And the bank had let go of you know, a uh, few hundred crores of corporate deposits uh, because of these issues. However, in the last two quarters, um, corporate growth has picked up uh, really well. Uh, so has anything changed in the uh, in the way you think on the corporate uh, growth side, large corporate side? So I'll have money and answer that, but uh, it's not really a deposit side issue. It's, it, it's really the growth you're seeing is primarily driven on the asset side. So, when you want to answer that, really? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, when you look at the growth, you must, uh, uh, like we always do, look at the advances and credit substitutions. So, if you combine them that uh, and look at it, the growth trajectory is not dramatically different. I would say the mix is changing more favorably. Advances give us better net yield than uh, uh, credit substitutes. So, I would say that it's more... Uh, profitability driven uh, than uh, size driven and uh, there is not dramatic change in uh, uh, customer assets per se. Okay. Sure. And in, in your view, the, has anything changed on the home loan uh, uh, risk reward? Because the trajectory uh, YOY growth in that uh, product, uh, that has come off uh, subsequently and now you are below uh, system uh, growth, whereas 
you know, two three quarters back, you were like two x of system growth. Uh, that has come I, to I, below system growth. I think you must look at two parts, and you must look at the overall uh, mortgage business per se, which is home loans and lap together. And I'll have uh, my colleague Virat uh, try and answer your question. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at in terms of purely home loans, I think uh, on the disbursement front or the demand side, it is working fine, and we are growing there. But given that the interest rates have risen in the recent past, there are people who are actually part repaying or foreclosing their loans, and that's that's where the impact comes uh, on the uh, overall book size. But if you look on the home loan and lap together, I think our growth was in excess of 15%. And that's the, and lap is a segment where we have been traditionally very good, and I think there is no uh, what do you call? We are getting growth both in terms of new customers as well as the book is holding well. Uh, I just wanted to add to that. You asked about risk. I think you, the the home loan product and environment is extremely stable, both home loans and lap. I don't think there's anything about risk. There is highly competitive pricing, and you've got to make sure that uh, you know you get your business based on pricing. And as Virat said, we have a combination of both lap and home loan, but no issue of risk at all. No, ma'am. I was just highlighting that the home loan and lap put together the growth. You know, in the last four five quarters have been 45, 40, 30, 21, 18, and now 15. Right? So there is a dramatic shift or dramatic moderation in the growth rate. You are still growing at 15% plus. But has anything changed because, of course, the rate cycle has changed? Has, is anything apart from, you know, uh, and that one should uh, take note of? No, it's not a risk issue. It is probably just a spread issue. So, yes, as your ROAs and RO ease of pure home loans fall, yeah, the, the, the desire to do more of that uh, reduces. And that, that's part of our product mix management on the asset side strategy. Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. so that is all for me. Thank you. And then that, that's what I meant when I said really, you know, we can still continue with uh, the credit cycle still looks decent, so your product mix on the asset side is still not something which you want to trade off, really. Right. Understood, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Saurabh from J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Uh, so just two questions. One is, you know, uh, this recovery and upgrade which we are seeing, uh, you know, from your net slippages, if we adjust for this intra-quarter change, the recovery upgrade is like 64, 65%. Is that something which you think is normal in the retail business or is it just elevated at this point? No, actually it's fine. We've been seeing the recovery upgrades uh, continuing to be a reasonable part of the, uh, of the strip pages during this period. So uh, this quarter, I said, there, there are two different parts of recovery and upgrades. One is the 300 which we talk about is 1300 slipped during the quarter 300 out of those 1,300 got upgraded during the same quarter itself. Yeah. So net-net, they didn't really slip into NPA for a technical reason, they slipped into NPA and got back. The overall recovery and upgrades is about 900 and odd crores out of the 1,300, which includes this 300. Yeah, so uh, sir, basically 600 out of 1,000, that's the broad number, 641,000. So that's 64, no, the 600 will not be out of the 1,000. The 600 will be out of the previous period number. Okay. Okay. Got it, sir. And sir, just uh, very quickly, what's the LCR for the quarter now? Uh, we talk about group level. <coughs> average would be 126, 127 percent. Yeah, so about, about 127 percent. And bank? Bank is 120. 120. 120. About 120. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Chintan Joshi. From Autonomous Bernstein, please go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you for taking my question. Uh, if I observe your CASA ratio. Sorry to interrupt, Mr. Joshi. Okay. Maybe request you to use your handset, please. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, sorry, one second. Um, yeah, uh, so thank you for taking my question. Um, if I observe the CASA ratio, it is down 70 basis points this quarter. If I look at CASA as a percentage of total funds, it's down 90 basis points. 
Uh, I hear your focus on uh, on active money product and scaling up activities there. Uh, the trends in CASA are more marked for Kotak than for other banks. Uh, I'm wondering how these trends will evolve. Where do you think CASA ratio will land at uh, post uh, maturity of the active money product? Well, you know, there are two parts uh, to what uh, you asked, really. I think one is, uh, I think Kata has SA and SA. Of the two, the SA part, I see it as a challenge for the industry itself going forward. And, you know, you must look at SA even across other peer banks, net of government business SA. When you look at your customer, non-government SA, I think it's a challenge for the industry going forward. Yeah, because customers are moving from lazy money, low interest rates to term deposits. Uh, definitely, one sees that as a phenomenon, and one has to be worried about uh, that as an industry uh, uh, as as we look ahead. The second part, which you mentioned, really is the choice. Really, is yes. Money moves out of SA, it actually it either goes into term deposits or do you retain some of that money at lower costs through products like sweep deposits? And that's the strategy which we've uh, uh, gone in for, and uh, it, it does result in some amount of cannibalization of SA itself into sweep deposits. But in general, you do manage to lift your overall SA out of that as well as get incremental new deposits at a cost lower than the cost of term deposits. So net-net, it works well from a cost of deposit point of view. Really. But do you have visibility on kind of where would CASA land for you after kind of the trends that you see? Well, you know, again, you must look at it from a slightly different perspective. When you're talking of growth rates in the 20s, Sa and Ka, and, and the problem is more with Ka than Sa in that case, takes time to move up. Yeah? Uh, Kasa does not move up in steps. It moves up sort of more uh, granularly at a constant slope. So it takes time to catch up. So I expect Kasa to catch up and progressively start moving up once overall growth rates stabilize. We'll have to wait for that. Yeah, But I, I don't see okay. too much of uh, downside pressure. No, fair enough. Fair enough. And the second question was on lending yield. Um, uh, uh, you know, you highlighted on cost of deposit, uh, the duration is 11, 12 months. Most of it is done now. On the lending side, how much of the book is yet to reprise? There was a healthy uh, 32 basis points increase calculated on, on uh, yields uh, this quarter. Uh, how much more can we expect? Uh, how much is left to be reprised? Actually, on, the, on, the, on the asset side, I think largely the repricing is uh, more or less uh, done. We don't see, uh, especially given the scenario that we don't see repo rates rising, I think uh, currently the entire industry faces the issue of assets which are based on repo pricing and uh, the, uh, the liability cost rising, the basis, different basis uh, uh, risk uh, playing out slightly. So I don't see... Uh, advances rate further going up. Some you know, about seventy percent of our book is anywhere on floating rate. So they are linked largely to the repo or at best the MCLR rate. So about fifty eight, fifty nine percent linked to repo and the balance to MCLR and whatnot. So these are reasonably changing as we go, as Manjan mentioned. As long as those rates don't change, they will remain where they are. So MCLR based loan will somewhat change, but repo rates are not that. likely to uh, change, keep pace with the cost rises. Cost, but the sixteen percent of the book is uh, got uh, duration greater than one year. Uh, is there no repricing left in that part of the book? That's fixed rate. That's a fixed, That's fixed rate. Yeah. Fixed rate. Okay, so it doesn't have that much uh, pass through. Commercial vehicle EMI, structured loans, all of those. Those are all fixed rates. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time and fairness to all participants, may we request participants to restrict to one question per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, we would request you to rejoin the queue. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Manish Shukla from Access Capital. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Jamin, going back to the comment that you made on 14, 15 basis points one off. So just to be clear from here on, does margin stay uh, where it is or it still falls from where it is in the second half of this year? No, I can't make an absolute this thing, but the sharpness of what you saw this quarter is going to be nowhere near that. And what we are talking about is to that extent, the kind of fall which we saw this quarter, the 14, 15 bits is things which are not regularly happening every time. So difficult to say it will not fall, but I think we still continue to be the highest uh, net interest margin earners in the industry. I think we'll pretty much remain there. Uh, and the sharpness is not likely to be of this variety as we go forward. So this yield drag, one of yield drag of 14, 15 bips doesn't repeat. And hypothetically, if cost of funds rise only 15 bips sequentially, margins ought to stay yeah. where they are. That's, right. Right. That's yeah. a fair way of looking. Right? Uh, second question is, uh, the high margin and low credit cost environment, some of that has gone as reinvestment in business. How do you think of cost ratios going forward, either later this year or more into next year, uh, in terms of cost to income or cost to assets? So normally, before Jaimin you know, tries to answer that, I would butt in and say, yes, downward, except the only caveat is my friend uh, Milin Bagnur here, to the extent he keeps on bringing in technology efficiency, some amount of tech costs will come in. And what happens really is as tech costs come in, there is a intermediate period of a bubble where you run your existing costs and you spend on tech. Uh, and at the end of it, and that bubble probably will be another six months really for, for us, you should see uh, movement downwards of uh, operating costs. And if sure. you look at it this quarter, if you look at this quarter of cost versus previous quarter, it's been reasonably at the same level. Of course, possible. Yeah. So, so broadly, if I was talking about the fact that this quarter versus last quarter, our costs have been reasonably flat, despite the fact that we spent a lot more on promotions. Uh, we got some one-offs as interest rates rose up, some retirement costs came down and whatnot, but I think pretty much an eye on costs as the industry develops. Sure. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Nitin Agarwal from Motila Loswal. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening. So my question is on the credit card business. Like We have been reporting pretty strong growth. So if you can talk about the key changes in our sourcing strategy, and uh, what is the mix of NTV customers? And related to it, on the overall unsecured piece, last quarter we guided for a mid-team levels of uh, book size. So are we still keeping uh, that intact? Because uh, there has been some degree of concern on the overall unsecured loans. So these things you can clarify. Yeah. So first of all, as promised, yes, we are, uh, our unsecured is just 11% of our loan book. So we are very much there within what we had said earlier. Coming to your question on credit card, mind you, 92% of our credit card base comes from the cards of our existing bank customers. And most of our new to bank acquisition comes to our existing customers of co-brand partners. And that gives us a very good comfort to grow both in terms of numbers and the spends. There might be slight elevation in 90 plus numbers, uh, but I think overall risk metrics on card business are absolutely in control. And there is nothing to worry at this stage as we see the card portal. Paul, you want to give a flavor of uh, card delinquencies as you see it? Yeah, so uh, overall as we look at uh, cards and uh, the broader unsecured, uh, the uh, behavior, you know, the slippages and uh, delinquencies are still in uh, line with, uh, you know, levels which we are comfortable. We're not seeing anything which... Uh, makes us believe we should change trajectory or uh, change uh, growth. Yeah? And uh, some of our bounce rates, etc. cetera, all, all those metrics are sort of uh, holding up uh, right now. So nothing to worry about. Right. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Gaurav Singhal from Aspects Management Limited. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. So just one thing. So the new CEO, uh, can you give us a sense of when will he start? Because the current uh, intervention CEO term expires, I think, at the end of October. And the RBI letter says he needs to start not later than January. 
So can you give us a sense of how this transition will happen? Well, the current CEO's term expires on 1st November. <laughs> so we had a board meeting today. So we will be applying to RBI for uh, uh, extension, extension of uh, the current CEO. We'll have to wait for RBI's approval to see what the extension is like. Uh, on the new uh, MD and CEO, hopefully over the next, uh, uh, I think, eight weeks, we should have uh, a better idea of uh, when, when about he will be joining. Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, the approval is for the joining not later than 1st Jan, so hopefully we'll probably have him before that. Yeah? But we just got to get, get back and chat yeah, because the approval came uh, uh, last minute, really. Got it. And my second question is on NIM. So uh, just so that I heard uh, correctly on the, on the previous question, uh, so if there is like a 15-bit rise in cost of deposit, let's say, so for example next quarter, our NIM can be flat because because the 15 bit or one off roughly may not repeat. Is that the right understanding? So, yes. so that's one. And secondly on NIM, got it, got it. And secondly on NIM, uh, when will we reflect uh, the Sonata acquisition in our numbers? Because that hopefully that can be NIM accretive. And including the Sonata acquisition, uh, uh, because we had given this 5% exit, a minimum 5% exit NIM guidance by the end of uh, by the end of March 24. But if we factor in Sonata acquisition, do you think that can be better because it, it's probably accretive? So uh, just to take that, Sonata, we just got the approval from the RBI and uh, it's subject to a couple of other requisite approvals. We do expect that, as Shanti mentioned, to be done by the end of this financial year. Uh, yes, it is a high-yielding book like microfinance. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you look at the size of Sonata advances, if I remember, it's about 2,500 crores. So while it is high yielding, net net, it is about what, 0.6, 0 0.7% of our overall advances. So it's not likely to make any meaningful difference in overall margin. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, due to time constraint, that was the last question of our question and answer session. <coughs> I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Deepak Gupta for closing comments. Uh, thank you, friends, and wish you all uh, happy Dasera and Diwali. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of